man, I'm, I'm getting lazy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I normally sit and hear my pastor preach. And um, not that I sleep in his services or anything like that. Um, but hey, man, praise God. Good to be back. Hey, man, my son's here with his girlfriend. Hey, man, somewhere. There you go. Boop, boop. <laughs> Praise God, amen. Let's turn to our Bibles in Luke chapter uh, 10. I want to swap my glasses again. Luke chapter 10. And this morning we kind of talked about uh, how we ought to love God. And now we want to kind of deal with how we ought to love our neighbor. Oh. <sighs> Yes, I've got a neighbor, man, that, that God's forced me. <laughs> so, you know, my wife knows that we have a neighbor, man. But anyway, anyway. <laughs> Luke chapter 10. Okay, you know, I mean, everyone needs a good neighbor. Yeah. You know, we've been fortunate, apart from the one across the, over there, uh, that most of the neighbors that we've had has is, is been good neighbors. And some of you remember back in the days where there was a, a hit TV program called Neighbours, if you remember Neighbours. And when I was a young boy in school, one of the things that, man, you know, getting home was, was important. I think, I can't remember if it was 5.30 or 6 o'clock, I think 5.30 was Neighbours and 6 o'clock was uh, Home and Away. <laughs> and so I'll be running home, make sure, you know, Carly Minogue, if you remember Jason Donovan back in the days, and, um, you know, you just wait for the theme tune. And uh, I'm not going to try and sing it, but we, if you remember, you know, neighbors, everybody needs good, right? We have a little understanding. That's when good neighbors become right. But the problem is, <laughs> the problem is, when you watch the program, it was far from the truth. It was far from that. I mean, all you could, you know, there was, there was betrayal, there was treachery, there was uh, disloyalty, there was lying, stealing, cheating, I mean, even murder. And as soon as it had finished, amen, at the theme tune, good neighbors is all we need, you know, some, whatever it is. You know, neighbors, amen, everyone needs a good one. And the truth is, amen, every you know, when we look at this commandment, <clears throat> especially when we look at, you know, I know we're kind of jesting, but, you know, the program Neighbours, oftentimes, amen, this particular commandment is violated to some degree. You know, um, it says, love your neighbour. Let's, let's read our text, actually. Uh, verse 25 says, behold, again, what we talked about is that here we have a lawyer this time. Before it was a scribe, a Pharisee, and whatever else, and now it's a lawyer. So this, this means business now. Yeah, you know what you see about lawyers, yeah? They know their stuff. So behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he said to, so, so he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind and um, your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You've answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho to, uh, and, and he fell among thieves who stripped him <clears throat> of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down the road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at place came and looked and passed by on the other side a certain Samaritan <clears throat> now this would have hurt a certain Samaritan uh, as he journeyed came where he was and when he saw him 
he had compassion. So when he went to him, band, so, 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 excuse me, so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper and he said to him, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And this, this lawyer, it's like he couldn't bring himself to even say the word Samaritan. That's how much animosity there was between them. He said to him, he who showed mercy on him, and then Jesus said to him, will go and do likewise. All right. You know, uh, it's a tall order, man. I'm sorry. It's, it's a real tall order to love your neighbor. We know I'm going with this, right? Because I know there's people that you do love and you class them as your neighbor. I think, man, I could, I, you know, like this girl, we can justify ourselves. But it goes a lot deeper than that. <clears throat> you know, there's a, a cartoon illustration about, about actually loving your neighbor. And it's, a, and it's a beggar asking for money. But what's funny about the cartoon is that he's got a mirror in front of his face. So anytime someone came or was wanting to walk past, they would see themselves, you get it? And so he's asking for money. And, and so the whole idea is, amen, is that what God would want us to do, amen, is to be able to treat people, as the Bible says, as we would treat ourselves. In our text, we have the lawyer asking a question. But you have, but, <clears throat> excuse me, but you can seize his intentions. Because the Bible really highlights right from the beginning, amen, that he came also, like all the others, to test him. In other words, what we're seeing again is that, that, that you know, they've been hearing that there is some other way to inherit eternal life. You know, before this, if you know, amen, um, um, how the Bible, you know, you know, in terms of putting all the scriptures chronologically, Jesus had already been teaching that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. He already promoted it and told people, amen, um, that basically, amen, um, he has come to rescue and to save um, and to redeem people. Excuse me. And so, amen, these uh, 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 lawyers and Pharisees, they're coming up and, and they're, they're trying to trap him. They're trying to deal with him. And so the Bible says he, they came, he came testing him. And we understand, amen, that there was nothing genuine about that. Now, let me, let me just pause here for a moment because the, the, the thing is, right, church, you can fool me, you can't fool God. I always used to say to my church, I mean, you can argue with me, you know. I don't mind. All day long. Yeah, but pastor, I don't think. I think this. And I don't know if you know what you're... Listen, we can argue all day long. But the truth of the matter is, I mean, you cannot argue, amen, with God and his word. If you remember the... Uh, the four friends who bring the paralytic friend, amen, who's got no legs, basically. He can't walk. And so the Bible uh, kind of tells us, amen, um, that as they come, I mean, it's a very powerful story, in fact, because <clears throat> clearly they've been hearing a lot about Jesus, that he's healing, he's helping people, he's doing all sorts of miracles. And so they said, listen to, they, I've been looking at their friend, they said, listen, man, we know someone who can help you. So the Bible says they grab him up, they're carrying him amen, down to, I, I believe it may have been Peter's house. The Bible gives an indication that there was so much people in and around that they, that, he, they, that, that they couldn't get in. So the Bible tells us, amen, that they climb up on the roof and they rips open the roof. This is how desperate they are. Listen, if we can just get you to Jesus, 
And so the Bible says that they lower him down. And in Jesus, amen, seeing their faith, I mean, instantly seeing their faith. The Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, this is Mark 2, when Jesus saw their faith, um, he said to the paralytic uh, man, son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, let me just pause there for a moment because this is a bit funny. Because they're saying, listen, Jesus is going to heal you. He's going to give you back your legs. Can someone say amen? And so let's bring him down. So, you know, they're going to, you know, they get into the room, they lower him down. I'm, I'm, I guarantee you, know, the people there go, this is it. I saw Jesus do this last week. <laughs> some, some guy was blind and the man can see. You know, the crowd is anticipating a miracle. Everyone's kind of backing up, I guess, amen. And, um, you know, people are poking and shoving and shoving. You know, what, what are you going to do it? And, and, you know, <clears throat> the tension's there. And, and straight away, we, you know, the Bible says he sees their faith and he goes, you know what, your sins of The truth of the matter is, man, one of the, one of the brothers says, hey, listen, just check if your legs are working first. They're not working. Because the truth of the matter is, let me just pause there for a minute, because the truth of the matter is, man, oftentimes Jesus wants to do the more important thing. You know, we all need something from God. Can someone say amen? But the, the one thing we need is salvation. Now, the reason why I'm saying this, church, is because salvation of, has to come via confession. Salvation is not forced on anyone. In other words, the Bible, would, 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 you don't see it. You've got to read between the lines. That when he came in, he sees his faith. In other words, what the Bible is saying that God, Christ, was able to see on the inside of what's going on in someone's life. That's an amen there. There's something else is going on. <laughs> like, they, you know, listen, they, they didn't need to be a confession. Because Jesus could see the heart of this individual and said, you know what, listen, brother, man, your sins are forgiven. In other words, when he came in, uh, amen, in the presence of Christ, for some reason in his heart, he was convinced this is the Messiah. This is the one we've been looking for. There's something in his heart that was confessing. And the Bible has to tell us, amen, that Jesus could see the heart. And the reason why I'm saying it is because when you begin to read on, the Bible says, and some of the, 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 the Sadducees were sitting there and reasoning, listen to this, in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Uh, who can, so who can forgive sins uh, but God alone? And they're right about that. That only God can forgive sins. But Jesus here is forgiving sins, so therefore, da da but immediately when Jesus perceived in his, in his spirit that they were, so that they reasoned thus within themselves, uh, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in where? In your hearts. It's very important we understand that he knows where we're really at. We can't fool him. I mean, Jesus does bring a miracle, a manner. It is, is it easier to, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and take up your bed and walk? He walked. We've got many illustrations of this particular truth that Jesus, a manner, is able to read our hearts. And the Bible is showing us, amen, that here comes this, 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 this lawyer with his smug self, with his in intelligence, right? And uh, Jesus said, I can see right through that. You know, God doesn't mind a little argument, can someone say amen? He doesn't mind a little wrestle. In fact, um, if you remember, <laughs> I, I, I thought it was funny anyway. 
Genesis chapter 18, God is one, God, God's on the move, right? Here's, uh, I always called him, I always get mixed up with Adam and Abraham. So if I, if I do it, forgive me, it, it's my dyslexia, right? But Abraham <laughs> and Sarah, old, um, really old, can't have children no more. Okay, nothing is working. But God speaks to them in a prophecy over and over again that, you know what, you are going to be with a child. But every single time that subject kind of popped up, you know, we know at the beginning, amen, they, they decided, you know, what, let's kind of do it our own way and let's get Hagar, right? And, and that whole scenario there and um, God says, no, but I, I've said to you, uh, you will be with child. And amen, one, one, <clears throat> excuse me, at one point, amen, uh, God himself uh, comes and knocks for her. I don't know if you, you know, remember in the old days, people come knock for you. The Bible says uh, some angels and the, the angel of the Lord, which is really, amen, a, what we call a theophany. It's, it's God appearing within scripture, amen, uh, on earth. And so God comes and begins to speak to Moses. And Moses can kind of sense that this is this is God here, and and all the rest of it, Amen. And and uh, you know, you know, uh, God begins to proclaim to him, uh, Amen. Listen, your wife. He goes, "Where's your wife?" And she's she's in the back. You know, she's cooking. And so she, you know, she's there. And you know, sorry, I, I, well, I mean, both men and women do it, but men, women must like. She, she was all she's air wigging. <laughs> she was she was over hearing some things and she uh, maybe her ear was pressed against the the, the kitchen wall uh, and you know uh, god is speaking amen to abraham and said listen your wife this time next year she's gonna be pregnant and the bible says that while she was in the kitchen behind the bible says in her heart she laughed <laughs> like she didn't laugh out loud the bible says Inside of her, she laughed at the whole idea. And the Bible tells us, amen, that, uh, you know, uh, finally she, she <clears throat> or rather, amen, uh, God had turned around and said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh when I said that? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I bear a child since I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? God is saying, can someone say amen? But this is what she does, right? But Sarah denied it. It's human nature, isn't it? God comes knock for you, you gotta lie in front of his face. <laughs> I didn't laugh. She was afraid. But he said, this is God, no, but you did laugh. God don't mind a little argument, you know. <laughs> I'll give you one more before we move on. I mean, like I said, God loves a bit of a wrestle. We've got a wonderful character called Jacob. Who throughout his whole life, we know that Jacob, amen, was his whole name uh, was, was birthed around, you know, the cunning and the deceitful, the swindler. You know, God already promised him, like, listen, I'm going to make you, okay, <laughs> the heir, that, that the, you are the one that I've called to. And, and for whatever reason, amen, like, no one in the family believed it. I mean, I, again, I can't go in it for, for time's sake, but, but the truth of the matter is, amen, he just, the, the, the whole way through, he's just stealing and tricking and he's lying, and he's just taking, and he's just, you know, it, it's like, this is, this is, God's called him. This is, this is God's child behaving like this. Taking a man, uh, his life in his own hands. And, you know, there came a point where he realized, a man, uh, that nothing he, he has done is working. His beloved mom dies, he, he never sees her again. His brother, amen, uh, hears that he's coming and says, I'm going to kill you when I see you. And the Bible basically turns around and says that, you know what, he, he almost like, he says, God, I, I, I need your help. 
And just before he goes to see his brother, the Bible tells us, amen, that he, he's lying on, on the ground somewhere on a rock. And he's actually praying to God himself. And in the bushes, <laughs> some man seems to just pop out. But we know, in hindsight, it's God, right? And so I don't know what Jacob thought of initially. Maybe he thought it was his brother trying to ambush him. So he jumps up and they start wrestling. <laughs> and the Bible says that they wrestle and they wrestle and they wrestle and they wrestle just before the, it dawns, the, the, the day breaks. I mean, Jacob is tired, is exhausted. And by this time, amen, God has enough. And when the Bible tells us, amen, <clears throat> That is wrestling with him, uh, amen. He needs to go because he says, listen, if you see my face, you're going to die, basically. And the Bible tells us, amen, that he just literally, after all that wrestling, he just goes, Doop, and he breaks his hip. And the reason why I'm saying this, church, is because oftentimes, amen, uh, you know, like Jacob, we try to mold God in what we want. We try to wrestle him in what we want. We try to, you know, God... No, you, you must do this and be this. God, you know, you know it, it, it's not going to work. You know, like I said, he likes a wrestle and he will wrestle you. He will indulge with you. But when he's ready, because we have to be broken. And one of the amazing things is, although his hip was broken, but church, I want to tell you, any Christian whose hip's broken, amen, they've been touched by God. And many times, amen, as believers, as Christians, amen, we, we often have to go this route of wrestling with God. As I said this morning, like I said, amen, God's word is God's word. And you and I are not going to get away with it, as in changing it and how we want You know, um, again, I didn't, this is not a, a diversion of, of, what, of what I'm teaching here, but, you know, <clears throat> the point is, as we see here, the smug, the arrogance, the deceptiveness uh of this guy, man, uh, this, this lawyer, <laughs> Listen, I, I talk to a lot of people, uh, and, and 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 so do you, I hope, about, about Jesus, right? But I, I, I call them Neros. Remember Matrix? Because it, it feels like that sometimes. Remember Nero? He started to learn that he could dodge. Neo, that's sorry, Neo. <laughs> Nero. <laughs> My family are used to it. So that's what they call it out. No. It's just... <laughs> All right. What's his name again? Sorry. Neo. That's it. You know, this scene, I don't know if you've seen it, man. You know, he, he's there and, um, you know, he starts to, you know, one hand behind. You know, you remember it? I mean, it's such an exciting movie. I've never, I love Kung Fu, sorry. You know what I'm saying? Forgive me, Lord. You know what I'm saying? I love Kung Fu, but that was just like, um, they were bouncing from the walls, spinning. I said, this is action. But that's what people do when you try to give them the word. They just, you know, he's doing all this. You know, people are always trying to dodge. And, and this, 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 this guy, man, this lawyer, man, is, is trying to dodge the truth. Jesus is trying to communicate something to which we look at, amen, before we close. But <clears throat> we've got to notice that he didn't ask, how can I obey God? Which would have been the natural question to ask as a lawyer. But he says this was, how can I inherit eternal life? He knows what Jesus has been, been teaching. But Jesus refuses, amen, to give a direct answer to the lawyer. So what he does in verse 26 is that he turns around and he says to him, 
you know, excuse me, what is written in the law and what is your reading of it? In other words, what Jesus wants to know is how do you interpret it? Because that's good, this is an important thing. How you interpret scripture leads you somewhere. Jesus obliges the lawyer, amen, to expose his own view of the law of Moses. Again, in verse 28, uh, um, and Jesus turns around after, amen, uh, 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 the, the lawyer says, love thy God with our heart and our neighbor and all the rest of it, amen. Uh, Jesus says, amen, uh, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. Church, what I want to say is that Jesus notices the lawyer's question is absolutely flawed. And the reason why it's flawed, because he says, what can I See, what can anyone do to inherit anything? I mean, what is an inheritance? Who said that? Scholar, Roger. <laughs> it's a gift. It, 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 his whole premise is flawed <laughs> because he's put the word do in there. What can I do? An inheritance is by its very nature and is, is a gift. I mean, all the laws were important. And some of them were more weighted than others. Uh, there were 600 and I think 13 commandments themselves. Uh, um, you know, uh, and this is why Jesus says, look, look, you know, you've answered rightly but 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 something bothered this guy because as he says is like, like you've answered rightly that should have been the end of the conversation but the bible says amen uh, in verse 29 but he wanting to justify himself said to jesus and who is my neighbor something bothered him He wanted to justify himself. In the Young's translation, it says, uh, willing to declare himself righteous, uh, said, <clears throat> or willing to, sorry, willing to declare himself righteous, said, who is my neighbor? He wanted to feel that my standard of living was good enough. To a Jew, his neighbor was confined to other Jews. Jesus had to kind of deal with this um uh you know uh, you remember jesus in his um uh sermon on the mount jesus says you've heard it said now who's been saying it obviously the pharisees the lawyers and the scribes and all the rest of it you've heard it said that you shall love your neighbor it's in scripture and then what they've added and hate your enemy that's what needs to teach you know, they used to pull out scriptures, and I think there's one in Psalms where, you know, because God hates, amen, sin and a sinner, amen, you know, there's this confession, well, we hate them as well, but that's, that's never God's intention. That we ought to hate, amen, our enemies, because Jesus goes on to say, I want you to love your enemies, but I want you to pray for them, those that persecute them, or persecute you. Jesus goes further. Man, I'm struggling already. So I'm not going to do this tomorrow. I mean, the animosity and or the attitude of these Pharisees, I say these, I shouldn't say it like that, but 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 Jesus repeats a prayer. Again, in Luke 18, again, I've got a few scriptures and we're going to close, but, but God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, like these swindlers. I mean, he was a swindler, Jacob, right? And um, God changed his name, right, to what? Israel. So I don't know what this guy, anyway, evildoers adulterers, or even like this tax collector, because of the tax collector praying. 
I mean, what kind of attitude is that? As, he, as they're in the prayer room, he's looking at us, oh, God, I thank you, I'm not like him. Amen. <laughs> you know, I fast twice a week and blah, blah, blah. You know, the reason why something was bothering him because he kind of knew and all those in around him knew that a neighbor meant more to Jesus than that. I mean, they had seen Jesus, amen, partying with what you call sinners. They had dinner parties. You know, let, let me, again, it's away from the sermon very quickly. I mean, you know, it's very curious. You know, one of the things I've always prayed for is I want to be like Jesus. And uh, sinners wanted to be around him. And I'm trying to figure that out. God, what was it? Because you were righteous <laughs> and good and holy, but just sinners just wanted to be with this guy. The tax collectors was with him. The, the, as I said, the sinners, amen. Remember the woman with the alabaster flask? She come bursting into the house, amen. She, she anoints his feet. And the Pharisee that was there, amen, said, boy, if you was a prophet and you knew what kind of woman it was, you wouldn't let her do that. He heals a leper. The lepers want to be touched. But Jesus reaches out to this brother and touches him, amen. And you see this over and over and over again. Uh, in other words, Jesus understood who his neighbor was. Or can I say, amen, uh, is that the truth is Jesus understood he was the good neighbor. And this is what I want to kind of home in on, amen, um, because what, what, what Jesus wants us to, to, to understand uh, is that for us to be a good neighbor, amen, something uh, has to happen within our hearts. Because they would have realized the limit. Like I said, I've got this neighbor, man, and he has been, been doing stuff for, for 20 something years, man. Bursting tires, scratching cars, reporting falsely to this and that. He's called me the N word. But as I, you know, as I'm walking by, I remember I was walking by him and, um, he said the N-word, like, really quietly. And I just come from church, man. Oh. <laughs> and I remember, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 again, I'm not going to go into it because there's some things that he's done that, that's really, really, really placed my family under some serious pressure. And I, 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 just the other day, I think last week, he came out and came out smiling. But what I, I, I tend to just, I, 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 no, no, no. Anyway, morning. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Everything inside of me. And I realized I need something more, man. Because everything I want to do right now, I want to kill this guy. And I turned around and I went, morning. And I jumped back in my car and I realized, because I, I, I preached this sermon elsewhere somewhere. I, I said, boy, it's still not worked into me yet. <laughs> loving your neighbor. Loving someone else. Like you love yourself. Um, pastor's not hearing me, so I can tell you this story, but don't tell him I told you. Please don't tell him. I, is it recorded? <laughs> don't tell him I told you, yeah? But I remember one time we were going to conference. And, you know, like back in the early days, you know, conference, uh, you know, we was going for God. Can someone say amen? We're going to hear from God. But conference still wasn't like, you know, we're going to floss, right? People buy up their dresses. Everyone get their hair cut, new suits, shoes, whatever it may be, amen? Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, listen, I bought this suit. I've been waiting. I was working, like I said, remember, I work in the city. And there's a shop called um, TM Lewin. And um, back then, you know, they were, they were a decent shop. And quite expensive. They had this suit that, you know, you know, them, you know them shop you're just looking every day. I want to get that suit. <laughs> you know, you come back again, you're going home. Boy, that suit looked 
You know what I'm saying? Tailored the whole. Anyway, I finally, after about a year or something like that, I thought, you know what? I've got some money. I've got some cash. I went in there and I bought the suit, man. I was so happy. And I remember, you know, <clears throat> uh, Pastor Abdul came back from South Africa. You know, I mean, we're good friends, right? People used to mix us up all the time. I don't know why. <laughs> but anyway, I'm seeing him and, you know, like, we used to always mock our missionaries, you know, our friends, because they'll come back with trousers like this. <laughs> you know, everything is tied up. You know what I mean? They look disheveled. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, you little poor team. You know, you've been out in the mission field. Blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to mock. And God spoke to me. Just give him the suit. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> No, 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 no. That's exactly what I said. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I kept saying it over and over again. God, you know I've been waiting for this suit. It, you know, the thing is, <laughs> you know, the thing is, yeah, it's so easy to spend money on ourselves, isn't it? When I had that money, man, swift like a, Cheater, I was in that shop like no struggle. But when it's somebody else, what, why is this? Where's why is there a struggle? I remember I said, oh, I said, I said, Abs, I said, come on, I said, you know, there's the suit. He goes, oh, you know, <laughs> I said, no worries, no worries, hey, man. Is this a blessing from God? And I went, man. I was like, what? I don't know what I've done. I went back to I went to conference with my dry old suit. You know what I'm saying? He's got some nice suit. I was like, what? <laughs> you know what? God had to teach me. You got to love people as your own self. How? how <laughs> I don't want to be late to the point, but you get it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and it's funny because you know Jesus, Amen. Huh? <clears throat> Or rather, you know, you know yeah, Jesus, when he's commending and, and, and saying these things, you know, the command actually, amen, to love a neighbor actually comes before loving God. Because it's in the Leviticus first. And then later on, we see in Deuteronomy, like we spoke about this morning, amen, to love thy God. But let me quickly read you this quote, because um, it's from a guy called Kenneth uh, uh, Bailey, I mean, really good book on, on how uh, Jesus was viewed in the Middle East. And uh, he says his word, he, say, he says, uh, Jesus uh, placed love, uh, uh, so Jesus placed love, God, before the commandment to love your neighbor in order of his importance. And he says, experience, um, um, uh, Experience that that is is oh, I've lost my place here. That is it. All right. <clears throat> Experience indicates that it is very hard to love the unloving neighbor until the disciple's heart is filled with the love of God, which provides the energy. I don't know about that word energy, but anyway, provides the energy and motivation necessary for the um, arduous task of loving the neighbor. So there's a reason why Jesus, amen, you know what, would put it first, because the truth of the matter is, amen, um, when we have been impacted by the love of God, somehow that ought to translate, that grace that we receive ought to translate to the grace to other people. In other words, people, all people, all people as God's, oh, let's go, I don't know what. <laughs> First, wholehearted love means in some measure to see others, uh, to see others, people, all people as God sees them and all people who truly love God with all of his being must and will, must, um, all right, any man, forget that. 
my glasses keep slipping up my face. Come <laughs> on, see. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that the neighbor is more than just next door. Okay, let, let me move on and close, right? Because I, for some reason, I actually kind of sympathize really with, with the, the lawyer. Because, you know, when we look at all the racism that's been going on in the world, you must understand that there's a reason why it, it's never gonna stop because the hearts won't change. Something supernatural has to happen. And this lawyer, amen, is looking for like, again, this change because the truth of the matter is, amen, he has been diligently looking at the law. I mean, Deuteronomy 4, 1, now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe that you may live. It kind of gives the impression, right? Listen to these statutes, listen to these judgments, uh, uh, listen to the teaching, observe them. And it says, oh, you will live, Proverbs 19, 16, whoever keeps my commandments uh, um, keeps their life. You can't blame the brother for thinking this. And there's these scriptures over and over and over again. Uh, but the truth, amen, uh, and I, I want to bring you to this, and we're going to close this in, in a moment. <clears throat> because... Remember when Jesus um, was on the road to um, Aramaeus? Jesus had died. The disciples are hiding. There's these uh, two disciples that are on the road and they're, 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 they're depressed and they're downhearted and the whole thing. Yeah? And the Bible says, amen, that Jesus comes alongside them. They don't recognize him at first because, you know, Jesus does, does deliberately hide himself. He says, what's the matter? What do you think? What's the matter? The whole of Jerusalem and beyond has heard what's happened. They've killed an innocent Jesus. And they begin to talk and all the rest of it. And as they talk, Jesus kind of like, he like basically, being Jamaican, he probably chops. You know, how is it, you know, you've been so downhearted. And it says in, in, in Luke 24, 5, then he said to them, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart uh, to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into, in, into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning what? Himself. They didn't have the New Testament. They said, I want to show you. In other words, all the scripture has always pointed to this one Messiah, this one Savior. And what's really a, a tragedy about this whole story is that this, this lawyer, this Pharisee, they just don't get it. And just in case you're worried, I'm not going to go into the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, A, number one. <laughs> because the story actually has nothing, or the narrative has nothing to do with the Good Samaritan. Jesus uses the story just to answer a question. What I'm saying is, is that Jesus could see that this man, amen, uh, needs to understand more. And that's why so, like, twice Jesus says, because if that's what you believe, if you're going to observe these particular laws, is that, go ahead. Go on. I, I, again, I'm, I'm not saying that he's saying it with, 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 with malice and, and we know that he doesn't do that. But I, I'm really saying that he's probably saying it with, with a really caring heart. In other words, go on. Like I said this morning, Amen. as you go on trying to do this, the, the whole idea is you're going to realize you can't love your neighbor as the scripture demands. That there's something has to naturally or supernaturally change within the heart of a person. You know, there are many scriptures uh, in the Bible. Um, uh, one of them, what does it say here? Hold on. There we go. There we go. I don't want to bore you anymore. But Romans 3.20 says, therefore, 
by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in the sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's the whole point. In doing the law, as you're trying to wrestle, you're doing it, you're doing it, you're doing it, you get the knowledge of sin. Okay. Give me one thing before we close, please. And we've got the Bibles. Let me illustrate this because the Apostle Paul, go to Romans 7. Romans chapter 7. And I'm going to dart around because it's very lengthy, but I'm not going to read all of it. I mean, Paul has been talking a lot about how salvation and the rest of it. And he kind of, this may be like a little bit of a testimony. It, it, this is a testimony. And we can read in verses 10. It says, and the commandment which was, the, the, sorry, and the commandment which was to bring life, I found it to bring death. His testimony is like, listen, before I became a Christian, I'm working, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to observe the commandments and do this and do that, amen. But what I thought was supposed to bring actual life, it actually brought me death. You know, go down to verse 15. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate that I do. Now, he sounds like he's losing his mind. He's just saying, listen, the stuff that I really want to do, but for some reason, I can't do it. And the stuff that I don't want to do, I'm always doing. The frustration. Verse 17. The Bible says, if then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Like he's recognizing there's something at work, and there's sin at work, amen, and the Lord's not dealing with it. Verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For I will, um, for, sorry, for to, for to will is present with, with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do that I practice. Now, if I do what I, <laughs> now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, later on, you can, you can digest that before you go to bed tonight. Get an easier translation. That's a new King James. And he goes on. And he goes on about warring and fighting and struggling. But the crescendo comes because he realizes, look at verses 24. He says, oh, wretched man that I am. Remember Isaiah? He will deliver me from this body of death. And he says, thank God. Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Savior. It was he came to that point, he recognized and he realized, listen, the only hope that I have. The only way that I can conquer this and deal with this, uh, you know, again, the, the, the Pharisees uh, uh, or the Jewish people and the Sanhedrin, I'm going to finish it, but the, 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 listen, all of them, they hated each other so severely. When Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman, remember the woman by the well? The disciples were hiding and said, boy, look at him. He's speaking to the... I mean, even she said, you have been a Jew speaking to Samaritan. The disciples, a man, uh, um, the Samaritans didn't welcome Jesus, you know, about the supper and, and, and coming into, you know, the, the whole... Um, uh, he sent his disciples out to go and find a, a, a place for them to pray and eat of the food, the last supper. And the Samaritan says, go on about yourself. So, <laughs> and John and the, the other brother said, listen, Jesus, we call fire and burn them up. 
Jesus, what, what kind of people are you? <laughs> the animosity. And so when Jesus uses the, the Good Samaritan, it just, mm, <laughs> It, it just got to them. You know what's powerful? I don't believe Jesus is saying this. He's not saying the story to go, da -da, I am the Samaritan. I think Luke is trying to point us to it. But when, when you think about the story of what the Samaritan, this, this, this good Samaritan does, I mean, he rescued this guy from death, right? He pays everything for him, right? He actually, you know what? If he sent him to the inn and with no, with no money or no guarantee to come back to help him, because he would have no money, he becomes a slave in this society. Are you with me? The brother saved him from slavery. And what's ironic, this whole conversation, right? Jesus is actually on his way, because this Jesus is on his last legs. This is this is last for he's actually on his way to Jerusalem to do the very thing that this Samaritan has done in his story for this guy. And he doesn't get it. Uh, I, and, and I'm closing here because it's so important. Because at church, what I want us to understand that religion can't save you, is what I'm saying. It just can't. It just can't. But a relationship, excuse me. And, and the only way, amen, that we're able to actually go on from here. And I don't know if I said it before, but remember Isaiah this morning? He says, for my eyes have seen the king. He said, the train of, I saw the train of his robes. And the, what, what, what the train kind of meant was all, you know, every king that had, you know, extended robes, it, it was all the people that had conquered. And the Bible says that this train of robes, was, it filled the temple. I mean, so in other words, this guy's got victory. And the Bible says that he sees him and at the same time, he says, I am unclean. But what's powerful, there was no observing of laws. But the Bible says right there that an angel came. And the Bible says the angel went to where? He went to the, to the, <laughs> the altar and got a call from the altar. Come on, someone say amen. And say every altar meant there was blood church. There was a sacrifice. Amen. Uh, someone paid for something. And the Bible says that the angel takes this call, amen, comes and says, he cleanses him on his lips. And if you read the story, the, the dramatic change in Isaiah was, was, was night and day. Because Jesus now says, right, I want you to go and be a good neighbor, basically. Because the heaven's having a conversation, and I don't know who is this. Read, read it, Isaiah chapter six, because the, the voice goes, and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be quick now because everyone's tired, right? The voice goes, or God goes, who will go for us? I mean, there's no one else. There's only him and Isaiah uh, and the cherubims. <laughs> I wonder who will go for us. Isaiah's like, huh? But you see no hesitance. Isaiah goes, me. Me, 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 me. I will go. Not, I mean, like a change, a radic, like God could ask anything, me. But I've never told you what you're going to be doing yet. Doesn't matter. I've seen what you've done for me. I've seen myself, I've seen who you are and how you still accept me and love me. And, and, and listen, whatever you want me to, I, I will, it is a radically changed life. Because all right then, 
I'm going to send you to a, a place, to Israel, and no one's going to listen to you. What ministry is that? You know, at the moment, I'm not pastoring at the moment, but I, I don't want that kind of prophecy on me. You know, you, you know Friday night, you know, Thursday, <laughs> you know, you know, you jump on the stage, whoop, da, 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 you know, right, you know what, you're going to go to see and no one's going to listen to you. Come say and say, you know, no, no, no. But you see, the thing is, this, this brother, Isaiah, he says, no problem. It doesn't matter to me. My identity is not in the size of my church. My identity is in you. I'll go out and do whatever you want me to do. No matter where it's just every, every head bowed and right close. I'm going to pray. Whatever you want me to do, Lord. I mean, you see this in Naaman, which ties up everything that we talked about this morning. Even now, in Naaman, the, the Syrian, the Gentile, the unbeliever, amen, he comes to um, uh, Elijah with his pomped self and all his gifts and his money, his career and, uh, you know, uh, his identity, and he, he thinks that somehow all of this is going to impress his God. Because he was used to bribing gods. That's what they do. You know, we're going to give you something, God, you give me something. Elijah turned around and says to him, but he doesn't really work like that in this kingdom. God doesn't work like that. Bribing. The name of It's my letter, so I can finish. How do I have to do this? Never said, go into the river Thames. There was a long servant there. Some of his other servants, he ran fast, he ran she would have been seen his father and mother died at the hands of the plumbing cities and towns that's what she would have been Think about how it's a small She named She reaches out to her and she says, no, to, to, to struggle and wrestle with his wife. Strips of all his accolades, all his riches had to stay at the bank. Gets into that world, he dips seven times and he comes in his skin. The reason why I say he's born again, when you read that church, that church was written in the It's a thing that says that it's a problem. It's true. 
Thank you. 